through the hallways of academia and on the face of the moon the footprints of conquest haven't left us any room to say Greetings and welcome to the 11th edition of Women's Liberation Radio News. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. This is Jenna DeCordo, and today's edition will cover the various women's marches that were held around the country and across the world on January 21st, 2017. WLRN contributor Niall Pierce was at the Women's March in London, and Thistle Patterson was at the Madison, Wisconsin March. About a week after the march, Thistle spoke with women at a Mishfest Remembrance concert in Chicago, Illinois, about the significance of what turned out to be a unifying symbol of the marches, the pink pussy hats. Sarah spoke with young radical feminist lesbian Bailey at the Seattle, Washington March. Diana Kraft, a radical lesbian feminist, a young lesbian going by Prezen, who also marched in Seattle, and Alexandra Tory, a radical feminist who marched in Washington, D.C. In addition, we'll hear women's liberation music of yesteryear, including a song from another women's protest march from over 40 years ago. And now for WLRN's headlines for March 2nd, 2017. Wolf's complaint in the case of the Women's Liberation Front versus the United States, a landmark case that argues for the right of girls and women to bodily privacy, has been stayed pending the Supreme Court's consideration of Glowchester versus GG. Wolf's complaint argues that the administration's redefinition of sex to mean gender identity for Title IX purposes violates the Administrative Procedure Act and women's constitutional right to bodily privacy. The Supreme Court has also granted certiorari in the Gloucester v. GG case, where a girl who identifies as a trans boy is demanding access to the boys' restroom, and several boys have complained that her use of the boys' restroom violates their right to privacy. Wolf filed a friend of the court brief in favor of granting cert in that case, as well as an amicus brief on the merits filed jointly with the Family Policy Alliance, and oral arguments are scheduled for March 28th. The Women's Liberation Front is the only women's organization involved in the ongoing legal battles regarding gender identity that is specifically standing up for the rights of women and girls. Canada's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Inquiry capitulated to pressure from Indigenous men and men's rights activists, deciding to include testimonies from men and boys. The MMIW Inquiry is a $53 million government project that was announced in early 2016. It's a known fact that an overwhelming number of indigenous women and girls in Canada, as in the United States, are the victims of sexualized violence at the hands of men. The Aboriginal Women's Action Network responded to this development with the following statement. Quote, those who are behind the campaign to expand the inquiry fail to understand that colonization bestowed patriarchal privileges upon men while disempowering women, a reality that is exacerbated by racism. Patriarchy, poverty, and colonialism colluded to enable male violence against women. Indigenous women and girls in survival mode of being prostituted face the worst forms of male violence. Since MMIWG rose to public attention, indigenous men and chiefs organizations have made every effort to insert themselves as spokespersons, as champions of the issue of violence against women, and now as part of the inquiry. Alas, they have yet to learn how to support and be allies to indigenous women. They must take responsibility for their contribution to male violence, move out of the way, and follow indigenous women leadership on the issue." Unquote. Just recently in Toronto, a pimp was sentenced to 13 years in prison for enslaving and assaulting a 19-year-old indigenous woman. His is the longest prison sentence given in a sex trafficking case in Canada. In early February, the Women's March organizers announced their Day Without a Woman campaign to keep the momentum of the marches going. 
Over four million people were estimated to participate in the marches, according to major media outlets. In addition, it was reported that the marches may have been the largest day of demonstrations in U.S. history. A Day Without a Woman will happen on March 8th in conjunction with International Women's Day. To participate, organizers are urging women to take the day off from work, not purchase anything, and to wear red. For more information about A Day Without a Woman, go to www.womensmarch.com. In Ontario, Canada, two men have been charged in a child sexual abuse case that took place over a decade ago. One of those men has since become transgender and goes by the name Jacqueline Laronde, his birth name being Sean O'Toole. O'Toole and his accomplice Martin Galloway arranged the sexual abuse with the victim's own parents online. O'Toole and Galloway are allegedly not the only suspects being charged. O'Toole, under his pseudonym Jacqueline Laronde, is the co-chair of Kingston Pride, the Gender and Diversity Coordinator at the Canadian Mental Health Association Kingston, and was a featured speaker at the Kingston's Women's March. Kara Dansky of Women's Liberation Front appeared on Tucker Carlson Tonight, a show on Fox News Network to discuss gender identity legislation and Wolf's Supreme Court amicus brief in the pending federal decision on the meaning of Title IX. In the state of Arkansas, a new law has been passed that makes the most common and safest second trimester abortion method, dilation and evacuation, illegal and allows the spouses and family members of pregnant women to sue abortion providers who perform second trimester abortions for those women. According to the Arkansas Department of Health, the dilation and extraction method was used in 18% of the abortions performed in 2015, the most recent annual record available. Julie Bindle spoke at the Working Class Movement Library on February 4th to a full house. Despite the intense backlash exhibited on the library's Facebook page and elsewhere on social media by trans activists and bisexuals leading up to the event, only about a dozen protesters showed up at the library on the day of Bindle's talk and remained peaceful. In the Republic of Ireland, the Sexual Offenses Bill passed, criminalizing the purchase of sex. The bill also strengthens laws that fight child porn and prevent the sexual grooming of children. 522 Johns and 30 pimps were arrested in the U.S. on Super Bowl Sunday thanks to the National John Suppression Initiative. Domestic violence reports have more than doubled in Russia's fourth largest city since the federal government decriminalized spousal abuse, reducing it to a civil offense. Domestic violence kills between 12 and 14,000 Russian women every year. Sonia Tabora of El Salvador is finally in the clear after receiving a second not guilty verdict in a retrial of her criminal case. She was convicted of aggravated homicide, rather than abortion, for giving birth to a premature stillborn baby in 2005. Abortion in El Salvador is a crime usually punished with an eight-year maximum prison sentence. Tabora was released after seven years in prison when a three-judge panel found her not guilty in a 2012 retrial. In 2014, the criminal chamber of the Supreme Court of Justice decided to review her case and try her again, that second retrial only recently taking place after three years of postponement. Throughout her ordeal, Tabora had the support of the Salvadoran feminist organization Citizen Group for the Decriminalization of Abortion. On February 7th, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts was silenced on the Senate floor after attempting to read a letter written by Coretta Scott King, the widow of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., expressing her opposition to the federal judgeship nomination given to Jeff Sessions in 1986. President Trump nominated Sessions for Attorney General, and Sessions was confirmed on February 8th. Republican Majority Senate Leader Mitch McConnell said of Senator Warren's silencing, She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. This sparked the Twitter hashtag, she persisted. Milo Yiannopoulos lost his book deal with Simon & Schuster and was uninvited from the Conservative Political Action Conference after a year-old podcast interview surfaced in which he joked about and seemed to support pedophilia between adult men and underage boys. Yiannopoulos is himself a victim of child sexual abuse, which he referred to in the interview. Soon after losing his book deal and being dropped from CPAC, he resigned from Breitbart News, where he was senior editor of the tech section. Norma McCorvey, the plaintiff in the landmark Roe v. Wade Supreme Court case that federally legalized abortion in the U.S. in 1973, died at the age of 69 on February 18th. McCorvey, who used the pseudonym Jane Roe in court, became an anti-abortion activist later in her life after converting to Catholicism. 
McCorvey, who was heterosexual in her youth but entered a long-term lesbian relationship sometime after the Roe v. Wade case, renounced her lesbian identity following her religious conversion. The Good Hair study, conducted by the Perception Institute, found that there is a strong national stigma against black women's natural hair. White women were found to have the highest rate of bias against black women's textured hair, with white men coming in second. In the national sample, a majority of black women were also biased against natural hair, but within the sample of black women who have natural hair themselves, a similar majority displayed a pro-texture bias. The Trump administration has rescinded former President Obama's executive guidance order directing public schools to segregate bathrooms by gender identity instead of sex. The Vancouver Women's Library opened on February 3rd in Vancouver, Canada. A group of trans activists crashed the library's opening night celebration, verbally attacking the women present, ripping down a poster on the wall, and stealing a bottle of wine. They attempted to block female visitors from the library, and one woman reported being shoved when she tried to get past the protesters. A week later, these same trans activists vandalized the building where the library is located, spray-painting fuck turfs, no turfs and no swerfs, and this space hates women on the walls. Online, the Vancouver group Gays Against Gentrification, presumably the same trans activists that attacked the library, posted a letter demanding the removal of 22 books from the library's shelves, most of which were radical feminist and lesbian feminist texts. You can donate to the Vancouver Women's Library at their website, www.vancouverwomenslibrary.ca. They are also accepting book donations. Trans activists shut down singer-songwriter Thistle Pedersen's regular monthly performance at a popular music venue in Madison, Wisconsin, citing Thistle's transphobia as their reason. Prior to carrying a couple of signs at the Women's March in Madison, trans activists had left Pedersen alone in her pursuit of her music career. But her signs, which said TERF, totally excellent, radical feminist, and don't believe the hype, trans activism is misogyny, upset them enough to target her places of employment and performance around town, in addition to threatening her with violence and stalking her in her neighborhood. According to Margaret Jacobson of Women's March Portland, Rebecca Brewis, a male who identifies as a woman and the executive director of Portland Trans Pride, has left the country for Canada in possession of at least $22,000 in donations made to Women's March Portland. PTP had agreed to be a fiscal sponsor of the Women's March in Portland, and the money was thus donated directly to the organization by donors who believed their donations would go to the march. Brewis decided to keep the money for PTP after the march took place on January 21st, and only after he stopped responding to Women's March Portland did they discover that Brewis was in fact the only board member of Portland Trans Pride, not one of three members, as he had indicated when applying for nonprofit status. So speak out, speak over, speak under, speak through the noise. Speak loud. So I can hear you, I want to know you, I want to hear your real voice, I want to hear your real voice, your real voice, your real voice, your real voice. This is Patterson reporting for Women's Liberation Radio News. I'm at the march here in Madison, Wisconsin. It looks like there's at least, I mean, thousands of people here. And 2017 is the year of the pink pussy hat. Let me say, that is definitely a theme out here in the crowd. I saw some actual peace pink pussy hats. We tried to say it five times all together. It was a little group, but I'm just noticing how women are organizing around that. And I'm really interested to flesh out those ideas about what that symbolizes and what it means in light of who's taking power right now on this foggy day in our nation. Uh, What does the pink pussy hat mean? What are we doing? Are we rising up? Are we finding our sisterhood and our unity? Are we knowing about our biology and how important that is? to what it means to be a woman. What are we doing? It's so beautiful out here. I'm very excited, and I hope all of my sisters all across everywhere, in London, in Seattle, in Portland, all the sisters everywhere, especially in D.C., rise up! Women, rise! If it wasn't for the women, women, we would not be living, living, we would
would not be joyful singing loving and beloved again if it wasn't for the women women we would not be living living we would not be joyful singing loving and beloved keep going if it wasn't for the women what would we do we wouldn't have health or strength or beauty we wouldn't have a home we wouldn't have food if it wasn't for the work of the women if it wasn't for the women women we would not be living living we would not be joyful singing loving and beloved women if it wasn't for the women what would we do we wouldn't have art or crafts or music we wouldn't have love we wouldn't have truth if it wasn't for the work of the women if it wasn't for the women women we would not be living living we would not be joyful While attending a Michigan Women's Music Festival Remembrance event in Chicago, WLRN's Thistle Pedersen was able to speak with sisters young and old about the pussy hat phenomenon and the importance of women's bodies. What's your name? Roxy. And where do you hail from? Chicago. And what's your name? Catherine. And where are you from? Also Chicago. <laughs> Awesome. So um, we got into a conversation before I turned on the tape about the pussy hats. And uh, Roxy, you were talking about how leading up to the march last weekend, you were knitting pussy hats. Can you talk about that and what happened to those hats? I sent them with my mom. She went to the March on Washington, and she gave them all away for free. She was just giving them to people who wanted to wear them and show their support. And I just think it's so important and cool that, like, one person started with this idea, and it just became the visual of the entire march. So you would see a pink hat with ears and just know that that person was protesting all the stuff that's going on and showing their support and their belief that these matters are important. And it's just so cool. Even on the front of Time magazine, this one image of a hat. Anybody who sees it knows that it's about this march and this issue that's happening. There's so much variety in the hats. What kind of hat was on the cover of Time magazine? And then also, what was distinct about the ones that you were making? Not much was really distinct. It was just any shade of pink yarn. The one on Time magazine, I think, was kind of a dark pink. It was a square hat that has ribbing on the bottom and just it looks like a hat with ears and it's just the image of it and so any way you want to make it some people just wore a pink hat some people wore a square one with ears some people had designs on there stripes it didn't really matter what it looked like but it was the representation of it could you talk about what you saw with the pussy hats and what has happened since the march last weekend yeah in washington i saw every kind that you could possibly imagine and i knitted one on the bus on the way there and as soon as i finished it, the woman next to me didn't have one, so she was saying, oh, you know, it's really nice, and I said, you better take it. And the first moment when we got onto the bus as well, a woman was passing them out as she walked to the back of the bus, so everybody had them, basically, and so many different kinds. It was wonderful, like real pussies, they're all different and special in their own way, which is awesome. What do you say to the people who are criticizing these hats for being transphobic because they are a reference to female anatomy that not all females share? It's a difficult issue, I think, because whether you have one or not, they do exist. And for many people, it's representative of an anatomy that's been held against us for much of history. So I think in a lot of ways, it's still a touchstone. And even like the word pussy is this, I have not heard people say the word pussy as much as I have in the last month. I My know. Time. Like I've, I heard a few people say it in passing, but pe the way that people are using it now, to me it's a reclaiming, a moment of reclamation. And maybe it's our true pussy power that's coming to the surface to save the earth because, you know, we are an important 
half of the species, and we haven't been in power for 5,000 years of patriarchy. And so it's about time that it shifts just so that we can survive on the planet because we have an environmental crisis happening. Women may have some untapped power in our wombs and our uteruses that is exactly what the earth needs right now to stop all the male violence and all the destruction of the big corporations and whatnot. I do agree that there is a power in women and I think it's a fearful power for a lot of people. Hence some of the images of the pussy or the vulva with the teeth. Oh, I didn't see any of those. Oh, you didn't see those? No. They're all over I the place. I saw a lot of ovaries uh, showing the middle finger and ovaries with a fist, but I didn't see the teeth. But yeah, in women's anatomy, in the female body, I think there is a lot of power. And right. I and then it gets misconstrued as violent power when, in fact, it's the exact opposite because it's where we all come from. It's not violent to bring life into this world. And in fact, the penis is classified as a weapon legally in rape. But the trans activists are trying to change that to make the female anatomy also possibly implicated in rape cases. And that's why this question of imagery and what kind of imagery do we use is a really important question that activists and media makers need to be asking. Do we want an image of the pussy with teeth when they're accusing us of being violent? I think the power, the power of the female anatomy is not like a violent power. It's a nurturing power, the ultimate nurturing power, that it can create life and that the woman's body can create life like right. that. That is so incredibly So the pussy doesn't have teeth? No, I don't think so. No, I mean, it's, it, it isn't a violent power. How do we counter them accusing us of being violent and also fight back at the same time, you know? That is the question. <laughs> It was really a great thing to be able to see, like Roxy was saying, to see everybody wearing these hats united through something so basic about all of us. And it felt very accepting, and I don't feel like it was exclusive in any way. It was more trying to bring us together. And, you know, boys and men are born through a woman's body as well. And so when you said everybody, that's what you mean. You mean it's important to all of us. Yes, absolutely important for everybody. Including trans people. Yes, I think so. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. I'm seated here now with two women who traveled from Cleveland, Ohio, to be here for this event. They themselves sing in a feminist chorus in Cleveland, Ohio. And I noticed Ardrey's hat. And the march is still very much on my mind. And apparently it's on the minds of many women because you're still getting demand for hats. What do the hats symbolize to you? For us, the pussy hat was a symbol for why we marched. And we marched for the right to claim our own bodies, for the right to express our own voices in our way through song, for the right to be who we are as women. And in wearing them, a busload of women traveling from Cleveland to Washington was this powerful feeling, not just what it looked like, but the feeling of wearing the hat. It felt sort of like a personal badge of identity and bold expression of self and what's important to us as women in the world. Might you call that sisterhood an expression bold of... expression of sisterhood. Yeah. You know, because it was collective, yet it was individual right. as well. The Cleveland's Feminist Chorus had three voracious knitters in our group that were knitting constantly during rehearsals. And I didn't become aware of it until right before the march. The pink pussy hat is an expression of our sisterhood and our womanhood and our creativity and our, our grassroots expression of being outside the system and the knitting in the sewing has always been a, the way we met, the way we gathered. We mm -hmm. always met around sewing circles and quilting bees. Weaving. But knitting, especially right now, is, is an incredible, active almost resistance. an active activist <laughs> well, and thing. I think it's because we are making our hats like we are making our lives. If we are now in a maker society, make that be personal, and that's what we did. And are doing, because and women so, are still right, making the hats. Right. The personal is the political. Did you see this week's Time magazine cover? The pussy hat, it's a movement. That was the caption? 
Awesome. And it continues to be something that our friends say, I need a pussy hat. I didn't get one for the march. Right. I didn't Interesting. Wear- I love how you focus too on the actual making of the hats and how that brought women together too. Well, here we were on the bus traveling from Cleveland to Washington and four of us were making our own pussy hats to wear a few hours later when we arrived. And you should see the pictures of these women with their freshly self-made hats. Right, that's beautiful. I would love to see those pictures. It's really important for us to organize women have a special role that we play in life and it needs to be expressed in our creativity and our organizing and that seems to be happening and that's very exciting because what other hope does the earth have but for women to take over and be the rulers of the world? You're making an important point, which I think is about how women have the creative piece, which is historically and mythologically female. So the feminine spirit is a creative spirit. We're here creating our lives and creating the world. So did you notice when you were marching how peaceable that march was? Well, everybody noticed that. I mean, that was something people went away with. In fact, the reporter in Madison said something that I thought was kind of funny. She said, the police reported that the women were very well behaved. That was like the last line of her report. And so, of course, the slogan, well behaved women seldom make history came to mind. You know, and I just thought, oh, you just neutralized that whole report, sister. We're reclaiming that. We're reframing that phrase. So, well behaved women kind women, peaceful women, loving women, make history. That's why the pussy hats are on the time cover. Because there's this new kind of energy that the rest of the world is still trying to make sense of. But we know what it means. I think the radical feminists are trying to make sense of it too. And it's interesting what it meant before the march and now what it means after the march. Because I think there was a transformation and a big kicking up of energy and all of the tribes coming together, all of the women coming together Mm -hmm. at the marches. We're reclaiming our lives and, and who we are. And when you look out across a million women and you see a sea of pussy hats, we are unified. You are listening to WLRN. Brought to you by the totally excellent radical feminists at Women's Women's Liberation Liberation Radio 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 News. News. WLRN's Niall Pierce attended the march in London and had the opportunity to speak with several women. We will now hear segments from those conversations. I'm at the Women's March in Trafalgar Square. It's about to start in about 20 minutes or so. Can you just tell me why are you here? Why are you marching today? Um, Well, I've got a number of reasons. My mother was always a woman's woman, and I've always been on the side of women, naturally. I think it is a man's world, and I don't think women's lib have done it for us yet. There's still a lot of women who are considered second-rate. And I think in my own family, my own country, I'm Irish. It's a very male chauvinist country, and my family were quite, still are quite male chauvinist. And I feel that when men achieve something, it's considered brilliant. When women achieve something, it's not even looked at. I'm also here with a group of friends who I'll be meeting later. They're dressed as clowns. They're from the London Guantanamo Group, which is run by a woman. And we believe that people should not be imprisoned without due process going to court and being found guilty. And we feel it's very cruel, the whole Guantanamo thing. And it's now 15 years. And last week we did a protest dressed as clowns saying it's no fun, it's no joke, 15 years being imprisoned like that. So I'm here on various guises. Actually, I could be with about six different groups, but I'm, I'll mainly stick with the Guantanamo group today. But I'm also here for myself as a woman. How do you feel about the march kind of being opened to men as well? I don't mind, really. I mean, I think there was a lot of men who helped the women when they were fighting for the vote. So I think so long as predominantly women... And you know it's a women's march. But, yeah, men are welcome if they support us. There are decent men out there who support us. Tell me, why are, why are you here today? Why are you marching? We're marching because we want to improve the inequality that women have faced over the years. And I'm marching for all our sisters who haven't got a right to education. I'm marching for our sisters who live in poverty. I'm marching for every single woman and sister globally as well. Me? I march because I want equality. 
How do you guys feel about some of the larger issues that seem to be co-opting? The main issue is about women's rights and women's freedom. How do you feel about it being co-opted by some constituents like men, for example? Yeah. Totally disagree with the fact that men have hijacked, really, our movement. And this Trump thing is just a side issue. We have to look at the whole global picture. We are from Swazi Virgin in Swaziland. Swaziland doesn't support women. So what Trump has done is the same thing that Swaziland is doing. Women don't have rights. That's why we are coming to support this. How do you feel about some of the other issues kind of creeping in on a march for women? It's not right because it would be the, our day trying to express ourselves at that day. It shouldn't happen. In March of 1971, Boston-based feminist group Bread and Roses occupied a Harvard-owned building at 888 Memorial Drive in Cambridge for 10 days, demanding affordable housing, equal pay, and free health and child care. The occupation resulted in the establishment of the Cambridge Women's Center, the longest continuously operating community women's center in the United States. The following song, Battle Hymn of the Women, was written by Bread and Roses member Meredith Tax. My eyes have seen the glory of the flame of women's rage Kept smoldering for centuries, now burning in this age We no longer will be prisoners in that same old gilded cage That's why we're marching on Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you To speak softly, to be gentle and to smile Expected us to change ourselves with every passing style Said the only work for women was to clean and type and file That's why we're marching on Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you Move on over or we'll move on over you Done your cooking, done your cleaning, kept your rules. We gave birth to all your children and we taught them in your schools. We kept the system running, but we're laying down our tools for we are marching on. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or You can buy us off with crummy wedding rings. You never pay us half the profit that our labor brings. Our anger eats into us. We no longer bow to kings, for we are marching on. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Broken through our shackles, now we sing a battle song. We march for liberation and we're many thousand strong. We'll build a new society, we waited much too long. Now we are marching on. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Here now are interviews WLRN correspondent Sarah was able to have with several RADFEM marchers who attended events in both Washington, D.C. and Seattle. I'm here with Bailey, who marched in Seattle. So, Bailey, what are your thoughts on the decision to make the Women's March in Seattle silent? Ultimately, I found it incredibly offensive, considering the, the climate in which we find ourselves with our president, Mr. Trump, the Royal Cheeto. This is the opposite of the time for silence. What was your personal experience when you actually did march? I understand that you tried to start a chant, and can you tell us what happened? And what was the chant? We did a few of them, as simple as my body, my choice. Uh, so your, your classic feminist march chants, right? So it's 
it's an intricate story, sort of a continuum of experience. And I would like to preface with a dream that I had a month prior to the march in which I was in the dream with the women that I was with at the march and I couldn't stop vomiting. And I remember in the dream that I was trying to prove to the people around me that I was more upset about something than they were. And at the march, this same exact energy is what moved through me, was I felt like my soul was being ripped out of my body and I felt completely alone despite the fact that I was surrounded by the people that I love the most, these women, and thousands of people. I felt like I was going to lay down and die in the middle of the street. When we started this chant, I actually had an older woman come up to me and say, it's a silent march, silly. And I felt that feeling like I was going to throw up my heart. <laughs> it was physically painful to have an older woman silence me and I think there were people around us who were laughing at us a little bit because we were channeling anger, whereas the people around us were treating this occasion as if it were a parade. And I actually witnessed a lot of people experiencing joy, and I thought that that was really inappropriate because this was not, by any stretch of my imagination, supposed to be a joyous occasion. This, to me, should have been a display of, like, we are angry, and we are not going to live in this world and be controlled by this man, these men. And I think that this march, a positive that could be said about it, helped me to define what complacency means and what it looks like to me. And definitely treating this occasion as a parade as anything but what it should have been was complacency. And I actually almost didn't have the opportunity to go and was able to go to the march. And I would still say that I feel as if I was meant to because it reawakened this righteous anger that I hadn't experienced in a really long time. And that feeling of feeling like I was going to throw up my heart, like I was going to lay down and die. Some of the women in our group later told me that it was important for them to witness that because it was righteous anger, because it was an expression of what we should have been experiencing and communicating to the, to the greater world. Diana Kraft is a radical lesbian feminist who marched in Washington, D.C. I was marching in a group, an organized group of women from around the country called Bunch of Dykes. And it's a, a group of lesbians who formed in response to Steve Bannon's um, remarks about something like all women who go to women's colleges are a bunch of dykes or something. One thing that was affirming about marching in that group is the response that we received from the marchers around us. I think it's well known that that was the largest mass demonstration ever organized in the United States history in DC and um, it was massive. Like I, I have no idea what Washington DC looks like because I was in a sea of people and to walk around with our pro-lesbian messaging, our, our banner and our posters, and to be chanting things like, the dykes are here, the dykes are here, um, lesbians are everywhere, we don't care what your gender is, men cannot be lesbians. We, we were met with a lot of support from people around us and a lot of people joining in. So what it looked like was a sea of pink because of those pussy hats, and mostly women. There were men, but it was mostly women. It was very much women's space. And there was a feeling of solidarity. And I think something that was even more exciting for me than the actual march was in our journey to get to the march through D.C. using public transportation and moving through the city toward the gathering point is the sense of camaraderie and solidarity with all of the women we encountered who were clearly also headed to the march. And this actually, I need to reel it backward in time just a little bit because I came from the West Coast to go to DC. And as soon as I started my travel process by plane, I started to get a sense of the massive descent of women on the Capitol because 
I would get on planes that were 98% women and 80% of them were wearing pink pussy hats. I would move through airports and I would just see masses of women in these hats which were very visibly identifiable and there was a sense that we were all in it together like women who didn't know one another were approaching one another introducing themselves talking about where they were from and what they went through to get there and what they were excited about for the march and showing each other their signs and it was just the the largest mass of solidarity among women that I've ever seen and I've been a radical feminist activist for over 20 years and this was the greatest most galvanizing physical uh, gathering that I've ever been a part of. Um, I was dismayed to see that um, one march, the Seattle March, changed the name of their event. They spelled women with an X. I'm not sure why. Uh, I mean, I have an idea, uh, but it didn't, it didn't make sense. So to see that kind of splintering happen and that kind of immediate um, dilution of why this march was called and what it was in response to, which was the open misogyny of Trump and his supporters and um, wanting to take a stand as women, as a sex class, and then seeing how immediately um, things were being watered down and like, no, we're not women, we're everybody. This isn't just about women, it's about everybody, um, which we can't effectively organize around our shared oppression if we can't name who we are and what our experience is. Did you read any of the materials that the DC organizers put out? And if you did, what were your thoughts on things like their platform? I have a, crit I have a lot of criticism of their platform because I am a lesbian and a radical feminist and um, their position on prostitution, um, which they call sex work, and their refusal to specifically name the source of women's oppression, which is men and male violence and male supremacy and domination on the global scale, is frustrating. There was a direct linkage of male violence and male supremacy and patriarchy to the plight of women, which is why this march was organized. But then to create these materials that refuse to acknowledge that is, is really a lost opportunity to actually move forward with a women's liberation agenda because counter to common belief, women have not achieved liberation. Like we are still living in male domination and that plays out across economic circumstances, that plays out across safety issues, health and wellness, our ability to move freely through space, our ability to access resources, education, um, employment, like it's, it's everything all the time. We do not have freedom from sexual abuse and exploitation from the time we are children until the time we die. You know, we have a lot to be fighting for. So to arrange this march so that everybody feels good feels like a betrayal, frankly. One thing, again, because I, I have some friends who live in the Seattle area, so I'm aware of that march a lot more than other marches around the country besides D.C., of course, is they actually called for a silent march. <laughs> so, all right, think about this. So the history of male domination is to silence women and take away our platform for speech. So these geniuses decide to arrange this women's march in response to Trump's inauguration. And first of all, we're going to misspell it, and not in some, like, you know, radical feminist, like, you know, W-O-M-Y-N, because we are divesting from malehood or whatever, but the X, like, what the fuck does that even mean? And then they insisted that the march, or at least the bulk of the march, was going to be silent. Silent. We are outraged, and we will not say a fucking word about it. Instead, we are going to carry on in a parade through the streets of Seattle, smiling at one another with all of our 
male partners around us and we're not going to say a damn word about anything but just know just know we're walking through these streets and we're women and we you know we have something to say we're not going to say it but just know that we do have something to say and maybe at some point when it's not offensive to you we will at some point we'll say something but right now right now we really feel that silence is best and that's fucked up. That is fucked up. So that's how I feel about that. Alexandra Tory is a young radical feminist who attended the march in DC. The whole day felt charged. I felt a lot of, a lot of strength from the women around me. It was less of a march and more of a shuffle. <laughs> there were so many people. I felt chaos. I felt too many voices speaking at once, all asking for different things. I felt disarray and confusion. I felt hope and purpose. I felt lost and found. I felt disillusionment and white ignorance. I felt pride and self-righteousness. I felt solidarity and fear. I felt too many energies around me to keep track of. At first, after it ended, I felt like <clears throat> it was a starter pistol, a bang felt and heard around the world, the beginning of the end. Later, I felt it was a photo op. Many people had come to be another body counted, not to march for anything in particular, but showed up for the head count and the Instagram. Then I felt its failures, the lack of self-awareness and empathy among white women that fed further division and upheld oppression. The march is what you make of it. There were so many realities there, such different walks of life joined together under the threat of tyranny. Reading about others' participation, the different encounters, helps me f form it into a cohesive experience. I felt at home among my friends and among the women I marched with. One thing I didn't feel was angry. I mean, there is a constant hum of it that generates on its own within me throughout the day, but besides that, I didn't feel its fire. I didn't feel anger around me either. There were lots of smiles, there was strength, there was passion. There was anger in some of the speakers I watched later, but the people I walked with next to and through, it was relatively calm, peaceful. I don't know if I'm disappointed by this. I think I'm somewhat brainwashed being inundated from birth with a culture that glorifies violence, self-sacrifice, that dramatizes the most mundane aspects of life. I didn't want or expect there to be conflict, but I also wasn't prepared to feel so safe. I'm glad that since the march people have been protesting more, that there's a spirit of resistance and that people aren't willing to accept the maniac's orders. I absolutely am inspired to take more action, to engage in political organization. All in all, it was a beautiful experience. I loved marching with my friends, and I loved seeing so many women in one place with such pride in their bodies and such vocal indignation at the attack on them. I'm very grateful I was able to attend. Prez N is the nickname of a young lesbian who marched in Seattle. So were people silent at the march when you were there? Absolutely not. We were surrounded by floats, children screaming and yelling and having fun and... Eventually, when we started marching and we were marching through a neighborhood, there were women laughing. And, and as we got to the neighborhood, um, there was this one um, black lady and she had her house was just like on the side, like we were walking by her home. She had a giant speaker blasting a song from the top floor of her bedroom. And every word in the song was, fuck Donald Trump. And she was shouting, not my pussy, you won't grab my pussy, Donald. And like shouting all these things and the crowd was totally into it and feeling her vibes and people were shouting, shouting, fuck Donald Trump. Uh, and it was just a really wonderful, positive vibe and people were singing um, and just cheering and, and there was just people with megaphones posted on the sides of the streets shouting about women's rights. We passed a group of um, young women holding a giant poster that said, you know, dec decriminalize um, the youth corrective system, you know, not having um, children in prisons and things like that. And they were shouting and people were like, yeah, yeah, you're right, totally. Um, it was not silent whatsoever. It felt like a march, but it also felt like a parade. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like a parade of women just like enjoying it and bouncing off of each other's energies and just loving it, you know, and loving each other. And the energy was teeming, and as we were waiting, we were getting news, 30,000, 60,000, 80,000, stretching six miles long, you can't see the end of the parade. Um, the energy was just building, and so we were excited. This is Women's Liberation Radio News. We now return to my conversation with Diana Kraft for more of her analysis. Can you tell me your thoughts on marching in general as a women's liberation tactic? I think that marching is important as 
a galvanizing force and as a way to come together in our physical bodies with one another and to feel what forward movement feels like in our bodies, especially in a world that is increasingly taking place in a virtual realm where people are more and more disembodied. I think coming together and occupying physical space is really important. That being said, the, the most important work is for us to be doing political organizing on a daily basis, including just building relationships with one another and doing consciousness raising and then organized direct actions um, and organizing for resources for, you know, the way women have always organized to create the resources that we need, such as battered women's shelters and rape crisis centers and um, food and clothing distribution centers and child care cooperatives and all of those things. So we need to be doing work all the time, um, and that, that should be our focal point, but we also need to celebrate sometimes, and we need to... We need to feel the might and the power of what it's like when you have over a million women coming together in a space talking about women's liberation. It's exciting to be a radical feminist today because as a woman who is in my middle years at this point, um, I came into feminism in the early 90s the climate has considerably changed since then. And what's inspiring right now is that I have been meeting so many radical feminists from your generation in their early 20s or even their late teens who are standing up and fed up with not just sexism as usual, which is, you know, what I've been fighting for all this time, but now the... Uh, the erasure of our ability to even identify ourselves as female and to name and describe the experience of being female in a patriarchal society that targets females and then meets out the practices of oppression through the female body. When that's the reality and we can't even identify ourselves as having female bodies or talking about the reality of having a female body, this we're reaching this fever pitch of insanity as far as patriarchal oppression is concerned. And these young women are standing up and they're pissed. And that's what's excited, exciting for me. Um, there are so many women who are writing online and speaking out and organizing and creating groups and bringing out feminist theory that has been buried or the feminist theory that gets referenced in gender studies classes but only as a secondary only through the secondary source of criticism of that feminist theory. And these women are seeking out the original words and seeing how radical it really is to demand autonomy, to demand boundaries, to demand full humanity and personhood for the female sex. And sex is an actual thing. All mammals have it. This, the transgender movement is really creating an entry point for many women to be radicalized. As they see the consequences of what it means to conflate gender stereotypes and biological sex and how that severely constricts the possibility for women's full humanity to be realized, um, let alone for women to be able to be safe. So. That's what's exciting about radical feminism. I think women need to talk to one another, especially women who are different from one another due to race and class and other circumstances. And lesbians need to be taken seriously because lesbians have a unique perspective on feminism because of our refusal to placate men and our complete autonomy from men for our relationships, our economic support, 
our sexual health, our love, like we don't need men. And for that reason, we occupy a different space in society. And it's a space that is a targeted and subordinated space, but it's also a space of great insight and perspective. So get out your Katherine McKinnon, your Adrian Rich, your Audre Lorde, who, by the way, self-identified as a lesbian, not as a queer, and start talking and creating theory and moving forward in the physical world. Get off the internet. Get together with your bodies. Share food. Go out into the woods. Follow the cycles of the moon and how your body is connected to that because the essence of radical feminism is it's about connection and interdependence. It's the the understanding and the practice of connection with a living earth and our interdependence on one another as opposed to the patriarchal way of being which is about disembodiment, disconnect, and individualism. That concludes WLRN's 11th podcast on the women's marches. I'm Sarah. And I'm Sekhmet Shiaul. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to catch our 12th edition podcast on trans activist hostility to women and women's culture coming out April 6th. WLRN is volunteer powered radio. It's only through the hard work of our team members that we're able to produce quality programming each month. Please visit our website at wlrnmedia.wordpress.com. That's wlrnmedia.wordpress.com to learn more about our mission and how you can help. Thanks for supporting Women's Independent Radio. Katina Hyman, signing off for now. And I'm Jenna D. Thanks for listening. The team here at WLRN is dedicated to bringing you quality monthly podcasts on topics other media sources won't touch from the perspective you're not supposed to hear. Thanks for your donations. We've been able to make these programs one hour long and will continue to do so. Women's Liberation Radio News relies on your grassroots efforts in sharing radical female voices. So please share this widely. Patriarchal kiss. How will we find what needs to be shown? And then after that, where is home?